Thank you so much, everyone. It's such a joy and pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really grateful to come all the way from Singapore over here. Um, Canada is a very special place. It's where I had uh, my two children here via two home births. And the last two times I was here, um, I actually struggled with um, postpartum and antepartum depression. And so today, for me to speak on unspeakable joy really speaks of the redemptive and renewing power of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Amen? Amen, amen. I am so excited to be here to share with you a message that's really close to my heart um, on joy unspeakable. And as you can see, this is our, our lovely family. For those of you who are against speakers on the pulpit wearing jeans, I apologize because these are the warmest pair of pants I have from Singapore. So would you forgive this little Singaporean girl from tropical Asia? Thank you. <laughs> So as you can see, God has blessed us with two beautiful daughters and we are right now in the midst of praying about serving in long-term missions in the field. So what has God been speaking to us? Over the past month, um, you know, Cliff and I, we just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary. This was taken recently to commemorate 10 years. But as we crossed 10 years, God placed in our hearts something that was brewing. You know, I just shared with Pastor John and Cindy, why are we back in Canada at this time? You know, it's, it's a long flight. It's expensive. What does God have for us over here? And the reason why we're here at this season is really because of this. While we were commemorating our 10th wedding anniversary, you know, God placed in our hearts to actually produce a series of short relationship videos for young people to share with them um, principles about relationships. And guess what? The unexpected happened when we put in our own resources, our money to, to produce this series, this video series. Guess what? It fell through. I don't know how many of you have put in personal funds or, or resources into things that you believe in, whether it's work, whether it's ministry, whether it's for school, and then have it disappoint you at the end. This project was supposed to commemorate our 10th wedding anniversary and it fell through. And one night, as Cliff and I held hands and we said, you know, we've, we've, we've done this. Like, what has happened? Weren't we obedient to God? We felt God tell us, are you ready to start on a blank canvas? And Cliff and I held hands next to the windowsill and I started to cry and I said, really? After all the rehearsals, after the scripting, after getting a videographer, after filming, really? And aloud into the night, we said, yes, Lord. And I want to start by sharing this because the next day was a Saturday. When I was due to meet a follower on Instagram, and I have to caveat this, I don't go around like reaching out to like random Instagram followers from around the world, but I did reach out to this particular woman. And we had agreed to meet six weeks ago. And because my heart was so heavy about this, I shared with her, Woo, wow. <laughs> I shared with her, I said, this has been on my heart and I'm so disappointed by how this project fell through, so unexpected. And she said this, I don't know how God connected you and me together, but my husband and I are film producers. And we film relationship videos for Francis and Lisa Chen, for Lisa and John Bevere. And we want to let you know that if you can fly yourselves to San Francisco, we'll sponsor the whole relationship series for you guys. And friends, when I heard that, tears came to my eyes. And this parable, of the five loaves and two fishes, this story came to my mind. Because before that, just the day before, I told God, God, we have put in thousands of dollars into this project and now it's gone to waste. And the Lord spoke to me and said, those were your five loaves. But look at how I can multiply that to feed thousands when you give everything to me. Friends, your detours in life are not a mistake. If you give everything to the Lord, He will amplify that and use that to feed thousands. When I had given what we had given, what we had sown from our personal funds, sure, it was a couple of thousand dollars, but when we asked the film producers, how much would this series cost? They said if you go up to the market, like the market rate, it would cost up to $70,000. I said, God, your economy is so different. Your economy is so different. So today, this morning, as I begin sharing, I want to ask, shall we bow down our heads in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit 
Father, we thank you. We thank you for this morning, for bringing us together. And we pray that this morning you would impress upon our hearts. What is the five loaves that you want us to give to you? What are the five loaves that you want us to surrender to you that you may take it and multiply them for the glory of your kingdom? Father, would you surprise us in delightful, unexpected ways? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to go straight into this um, scripture reading. You know, we, we, we've read it already, but I want to highlight a couple of things. You know, when, when, when Jesus lifted up his eyes, if you look at verse 5, and he saw a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Friends, did you know this? That when the 5,000 were being fed, they were not starving. They were not on the edge of hunger and dying. They were not. Jesus didn't need to feed them. Do you understand? If, if they weren't fed, they're not going to go home and pass out along the way. They're not. But guess what? The first miracle that Jesus did, it was turning water into wine at a wedding banquet. Why does he need to do that? And this is what strikes me, that God doesn't need us in ministry. Guess what? If you don't say yes to him, if you and I don't say yes to him, the kingdom's not going to lose out. Because this is the hard truth. He's going to use somebody else. But guess what our loss is? It's the loss in the great adventure that he gets to bring us on. It's the loss of a great story that you can tell for years to come for a heritage and a legacy that you leave for your children and your children's children. This story, Jesus didn't need to feed the 5,000, but he did it to test them. And then Philip said to him, my goodness, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. It is not. It's just so many of them. How can we feed them? But then, in verse 9, somebody says to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And friends, isn't that what we tell the Lord always? I have so little. What can I give to you? Friends, I've been a stay-at-home mom before. I know what it's like to change diapers and wipe poop and spit all day long. We've been through those seasons. We've been through the seasons of mundaneness, of work. It's just 8 to 6 or 8 to 10 every single day. And it's so boring. And we ask the Lord, I just have this. What do I have to offer amidst all the great adventures that you have on earth? But this is the funny thing. When Jesus said, make the people sit down, and the men sat down, and Jesus took the loaves, and when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And the amazing thing is this. I always wonder, what if that little boy didn't give up his five loaves? We just assume that he gave it up willingly. But what if he had a choice? And I'm sure he did. What if he said no? These are mine. <laughs> These are mine. Please don't take my five loaves. It is all I have. But you know, that's what we do. I'll share a story with you later on. But a lot of times we say, These are my five loaves. And God, what's the point of you taking them if nothing much can be used out of them? And from here, I want to share a, the, the first thing that happened in my Christian life. Not many, not every one of you might know this, but when I was 17 years old, when I first accepted Christ, something crazy happened. God called me. He put a little nudging, a little stirring in my heart to go to Nepal to stay there for six weeks. And this is what I really want to encourage each and every one of you to do. Not to just sign up for a mission trip overseas. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this, to heed that still small voice in your hearts to do something different from your everyday routine. We're talking about unspeakable joy here. And yet, what stops that? What stops unspeakable joy, I can tell you, from somebody who's been through the depths of the valleys, is not depression itself. It is monotony. And if you are struggling with the everyday routine of life, that robs you of unspeakable joy. And the only way to get out of that is to do something different, go out of your comfort zone. And that can look different for different people. 
You know, it doesn't always have to look like missions. It can even look like starting a new exercise class to know people from who are pre-believers. It can look like stepping out to do and start a completely different thing. It could look like getting your kids together to start a family band. I don't know what it could look like, but stepping out of your comfort zone. And so when I was 17, you know, my parents, the very traditional, pre-believing Chinese, Asian parents, I've never been out later than 10 p.m. at night. And then the first thing I said to them was, you know, I just accepted Jesus and I think he wants me to go to Nepal where there are bomb blasts and the Maoist uprising and it's political instability. Guess what they said? Sure. No. (laughs) They said, what? Are you crazy? No, of course not. But the amazing thing was this, when I stepped out of my comfort zone, my parents were put out of their comfort zones as well. And that's where we invited the Holy Spirit to come and work in our lives because I prayed and I said, God, you have to come through this. This is an unusual situation. I need you to work unusually. So friends, don't limit God. If you think these are my boundaries, I am a stay-at-home mom. I am an office worker. I am a full-time church minister. I am just a student. Those are your boundaries. Don't limit God. Because what happened next really blew my mind. It was this. My father owned a company of only five staff. It's a really tiny company. Can you imagine that one of those five staff knew a Singaporean missionary from Nepal who was coming back to Singapore for two weeks on furlough and wanted to meet my dad. And my dad met her for dim sum. And after the dim sum, my dad came back and said, She says she will look after you when you're in Nepal. This is really bewildering, but I'll let you go. Seems like the universe is working for you. He he didn't know God. And so I went. And while I was there, this this was the crazy thing that happened. While I was there, God impressed upon my heart to paint and illustrate a picture book called Kite Song. And it was because of this, while we were there, we were evicted, suddenly, traumatically, overnight. The Lord spoke to us and said, what the children really need is a permanent home. Those of you who have moved homes before, you know how traumatic it is, right? But imagine if you didn't have movers. Imagine you had to do everything yourself and you had 30 kids to move out with you. How would that look like? And they did this year after year after year. And the Lord spoke to me and said, they need a permanent home. And I asked the pastors, I said, how much would a permanent home cost? And they said, $100,000. And that's when I had my five loaves moment. I said, God, I am 17 years old. I don't have a medical degree. I haven't even been accepted to university. I have no skills. I have mild depression. I just accepted Christ. I've never read the Bible in full before. Who am I? And the Lord said, I want that little bit that you have. I want that. I brought my painting to the publisher. Guess what he said? I would really love to help you. I really want to sponsor you. But your paintings are so bad. (laughs) These are not publishable at all. (laughs) So I sat on the aisles of the National Library and I taught myself how to paint. And friends, the amazing thing is this. When the Holy Spirit works in your life, unusual things happen. When we're talking about unspeakable joy, it's not normal. It's not a normal joy. It's unspeakable, unthinkable, undescribable. It's beyond your normal limits. And for that to happen, it requires a radical surrender, something out of your comfort zone. So today, as we go through this, I want us to think about what is it that God has called you to. And eventually, when the book was published, three months later, more than $100,000 was raised. Not because I was eloquent. You know, friends, at that time, I was terrified to speak on stage. I only spoke at one church because my speaking was so bad. And through word of mouth, more than $100,000 was week. They purchased this home, finally. And this is a picture of the girls who had grown up from the first picture that you saw. And this is a picture of almost the same girls sitting in nearly the same positions, but 10 years apart. And as you look at this, friends, I want you to see this, that when you give your five loaves to God, it is not a five loaves feeding 5,000 moment, and you know what, close the book and that's it. Your five loaves sow a seed 
for the generations to come. Whether you have children or not, biological children, your life leaves a spiritual legacy for the generations to come. And this is what it looks like. And when you don't give to God and say, God, these are my five loaves, I won't do it. Guess what? I am certain those beautiful girls would still grow up and do great things with their lives because I am not indispensable in the kingdom. God would just use someone else, but now I get to own this kite song story and adventure. Because God chose to use a broken little girl like me. My question for you today is, where is your brokenness? God wants to use exactly that to prove to the world that He is Christ. Some of you um, might know a little bit about Chinese calligraphy. I put this picture here because just before I came to Singapore, God spoke to me something really bizarre. And I share this in contrast to the missions example because some of you might just not feel a connection with, with missions. But this is something in your everyday life. And I woke up one morning and I just felt the Lord ask me, will you write Chinese calligraphy again? And I said, what? Do you know I've not written for 20 over years? This is something I learned when I was five years old. It's one of those things, I'm sorry. To me, it was like kumon. Every weekend, you have to do this. And I'm like, I hate this. Mom, Dad, can I stop this week? No, keep doing it. Mom, Dad, can I stop next week? No, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on. You have to win the national championships before you can stop. Oh, wow. That, that fast forwarded a lot. Let's go back to that slide. <laughs> Thank you. I got so tired of it. Guess what? I won the national championships one year. And that was the last year I wrote. After that, I quit. And for more than 20 years, I stopped writing. And just a couple of months ago, the Lord said, Will you write for me again? This time to tell a story of renewal, of redemption. Put it up as a public exhibition. I want people to foster God-centered conversations around these art pieces. And I said, Oh my Lord. I don't know how to do this. I'm not an exhibition person. I'm not an artist. Like, I don't know how to do these things. And then out of the blue, out of the blue, he sends a random person that I don't know to me. And this person says, I run the, some of the biggest malls in Singapore. I own those spaces. And if those of you who know what Singapore is like, it's such a small city state, land is like gold. Right? And so many people told me, they said, you shouldn't start this art exhibition. You're going to lose a lot of money. You're trying to use this. God spoke to me. He said, use this to fundraise for Kite Song Global, your nonprofit." And I'm like, just holding the exhibition alone would cost us tens of thousands of dollars just by booking the venue space. And this gentleman shows out of nowhere and he says this, I own these malls in Singapore. All this land and space belongs to me. And he said, what do you want? When do you want it? The land is yours, as long as it's available for the dates. And when I heard that, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. I am the Lord of a thousand hills. I own all the cattle in the world. What is it that you need to do my work that you do not have? So often we tell the Lord, Lord, I only have five loaves, but we forget that He is the Lord that owns a thousand hills and a thousand cattle. All the cattle, all the hill in the world belongs to Him, friend. I want to encourage you, those of you who are in the arts, in photography, in videography, you might not be in the sciences, you might not be in engineering, you might be doing something completely different. Would you honour that gift and talent that God has given to you, whether it's you know, being personal, one-on-one -on -one with somebody, because God can use that for the glory of His kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. I want to keep on going and share this, that 
a lot of people don't know this, but when I was in medical school, what had happened was I fell into a deep depression. And you know, in Canada, with the weather like that, <laughs> I can imagine it's sometimes hard to feel that unspeakable joy. But guess what? God used that period of refining and pain to birth different kinds of ministries from it. And one day he asked me this. He said, would you share your story about depression to other people? And I said, no, I can't because I was just graduating from medical school. I wanted to have a perfect resume, like pristine. And Singapore is so small. Like if word gets out, who's going to employ me? Seriously, I'm supposed to be a doctor, not a patient. But the amazing thing was this. When God said, go, the book was published close to my birthday. And the amazing thing was this. He gave me a vision. He said, he gave me a vision and, and this vision was really bizarre. I was speaking in the States to a group of people. And at that time, you must understand, I'm a 21-year-old. I don't have any idea what public speaking internationally looks like. But I had this vision. And the amazing thing was this. Over 10 years later, when I was at Johns Hopkins doing my Masters of Public Health, one day I received a phone call. I was outside the bathroom and I got this call and this woman is like, she's like, hello, in an American accent and I'm like, who are you? And usually I never pick up my phone but I, 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 I just happened to answer that call and she says, hi, you know, I'm from Nashville. And she says this, she says, I used to manage like some of the biggest labels in Christian music, and now I've started my own nonprofit. I'm holding a Christian women's conference. Would you be our keynote speaker? And I'm like, really? And I'm like, um, what's your conference about? And she's like, it's about healing. It's about journeying to freedom. And I'm like, I shouldn't talk so much. As, as soon as she hears my Singaporean accent, she's going to change her mind, right? So I'm like, ah, oh, okay. When is it? Because I'm sure I can't go. I'm sure I have school or whatever. It was just after my graduation. Who could have planned it better but God? And I ended up speaking. And as I spoke, I felt the Lord remind me. I gave you this vision over 10 years ago. Like how I gave Joseph a dream. I gave you a dream. Friends, there are many dreams in this auditorium today that God has given to you, birth in your hearts. And for over a decade even, you might have been brewing over them, thinking about them, pondering over them. They have not come to pass. Don't give up. Keep walking in the path that God has called you to because that is where God is working. He is working. He is working. Shortly after that, Cliff and I got married and we went to Uganda for a year to serve. And this is the story that when Cliff and I got together, some of you know his inspiring story. He has his own powerful testimony. He had liver cancer when he was 10, went through a liver transplant here in Canada, then went on to do an Ironman. But just before we got married, Cliff had a liver crisis. And suddenly, everybody who loved him said, oh, you know, he's really a good potential. You know how us Asians are, have to measure all the KPIs and the criteria for us, weigh them all. Oh, he has a liver crisis. Oh, maybe he's just good as a friend. You know, keep your distance until it's all sorted out. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, will you serve me together with Cliff while you're young and fresh and healthy rather than wait till the end of your lives? And so we took a year off and we went to, to Uganda to serve. And that, for me, was a valley moment to throw away things that were important to me, like my surgical training, that was important to me. But when I look back now, I think about the boy with that five barley loaves. A little boy, you know those of you who have kids, if you give them one m and it is so important to them. These five barley loaves, they are mine. But that's the funny part. God says, I want that. Can you give it to me? And when I gave it to him, years later, when I got the scholarship to go to Johns Hopkins, I asked the committee. I, I got to know one of the board members after they had awarded the, the scholarship, of course. And I said, why did you pick me? Because of all the people that you had, I'm the only one with Bs and Cs on my transcript because of depression, right? I had 
that in university. Everybody else had straight A's. I only had one A. One A. And I said, what was it? And they said, we saw you went to Uganda for a year. And we thought nobody could have topped that sincerity. And I said, God, you are the God of everything and you know. So friends, what you think as a sacrifice could be God's greatest gift to you. Don't be afraid to give it to him. When you give your all, he will give you everything and more than you dare imagine. Maybe not in the way you think or expect, but in ways that will blow your mind. Later on, Cliff and I got married, and um, due to time, I won't go into this, but we eventually went to Uganda, like I mentioned. And the thing was this. Just before we went to Uganda, I remember this. No, 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 no. Okay, I think this is a relevant testimony. I should share it. You guys ready? You guys ready? Okay, excited, eh? Okay. I feel, I feel you. I feel the resonance. Okay, good. So, you know, now, now, now this, is, this is a bit vulnerable on my part because now, now, now I'm worried you will judge me. Okay? A young female preacher who says that she didn't quite enjoy her first wedding in Singapore. Mm, you're going to judge me now. Mm, go ahead. So I've always dreamed of a garden wedding, okay? Uh-huh. But in Singapore, a garden wedding cost tens of thousands of dollars, which we did not have. And my senior pastor said, heaven in the church. So we did. And it was wonderful. And we raised funds for... God spoke to us and said, give all your wedding proceeds to two anti-sex trafficking ministries. And we were like, what? This is, this is the time we make money, right? Again, very Asian. Make the money, recoup the losses. Think about how to strategize your wedding banquet so you can keep some savings, start your marriage on the right foot, right? And God said, give everything away. I'm like, can I keep $1,000, please, just to cover the dim sum refreshments and stuff? And the Lord said, no. But this is what happened. Months later, months later, we, was, we were due. Actually, some of you sponsored the air tickets for Cliff and I to come back here. And I thought to myself, Canada, summertime, best time to do a garden wedding. We can do a little ceremony here. Kayla saying, no. Guess what? All the wedding venues are booked up. The ones that are available are tens of thousands of dollars. I said, God, what happened to my garden wedding? And some of you, yeah, now you're casting judgment. Or you already had a wedding in Singapore. You, missionary speaker, won another wedding, a garden wedding. Really? Where's the frugality? God blew my mind when he spoke to me that he cares about the desires of our hearts. And this is the amazing thing. A couple of months later, I started to write to, you know, different wedding venues and I kept getting rejected. It came to a point where I told Cliff, do you have a friend with a nice backyard? We'll just do a barbecue wedding thing, you know, like a potluck. Cheapest, right? (laughs) And one day I get an email from Toronto Botanical Gardens one of the top 10 wedding destinations in the world. And they wrote to me and they said, we watched your testimony video of how you and Cliff came together. They're not even Christian, by the way. And she said, I receive hundreds of emails a day and I usually never even get to open them. But for some reason, I clicked on your video and we want to let you know we're all booked up. We are all booked up for the summer. But... There is one garden that we are launching and we would like to sponsor your entire wedding if you would allow us to use your wedding photos for advertising in the years to come. What did I say? I cried and I screamed and I said, yeah, I'll take it. (laughs) But this brought me to tears and it still does even after 10 years. Because it reminds me that God cares about you as a person. And some of you might be wondering, God, where is my moment? You've done this for YJ, how about me? I want to encourage you with this truth. And I want you to declare it today. That God loves me. Say it with me. God loves me. He loves me with a deep love. And as you pursue him wholeheartedly, 
He's going to come running after you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the years of my life. Do you know the word follow? It's not follow. If you look at the Hebrew root word, it is pursue, it is a chasing, it is a persecuting. That is the ferocity of what follow means. And when I remember this story, I remember God pursues us and he will pursue you. I eventually went to Hopkins, that Sarah Faith, when she was very young. Um, and eventually, when we came back, COVID-19 broke out in Singapore. This is the last story I'll share before I close. When COVID-19 broke out, I asked the Lord again, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I came back with a newborn and a toddler and I was still nursing them. And I said, I'm really useless. They were calling for doctors to go on the front lines. And I said, I can't. My husband is immunocompromised. Back then, we knew very little about COVID, by the way. My husband is immunocompromised. I have a newborn. I am the last person that you should use. And in fact, I told God this. You have given me my family to steward. Don't call me to do other things. Okay? And that, friends, is what I want to challenge us all today. There are seasons we must acknowledge that God has called us to steward certain things like your family, like your children. But there are also times, there will be moments where God is going to call you out of that comfort zone and do something radically different. And He's going to say, I'm going to look after what you are stewarding so that you can step out and do something that I've called you to, something radical. So at that time, I was afraid. And Cliff said, he held my hand and he said, you have to volunteer and go back to the front line. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, I cannot. It's too much for me. And somehow, through a, a divine encounter with different people, I found myself at the front lines. It was so embarrassing. You know, I had to ask the nurses how to teach me how to wear PPE because I had been out of clinical work for seven years. I said, I'm too scared. And Cliff one day, he reminded me of this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. This happened because one of my mentors said, can you help me draw a health booklet for all the migrant workers, the 55,000 migrant workers who now have COVID? Can you draw a health booklet for them? Can you translate the work and explain to them what's happening? And guess what I said? Huh? Me? I graduated from Johns Hopkins, you know. Why are you asking me to draw a health booklet? And my reaction was, huh? But sometimes that's the case, isn't it? God is asking for our five loaves and we say, no, God, I can give you something better. Don't ask me for this. But no, that's exactly what he wants. And Cliff said, look at today's Oswald Chambers devotional. It's this verse. It's for you. And I really hate this because Cliff saw me look at my mentor's text. Can you draw the health booklet? And I just did this. Hmm. And he read my face and he kind of looked over and he said, I know what you're thinking. This is for you. So he mind reads me all the time. And when I did, guess what happened? The booklet became tens of thousands of booklets all across Singapore. And guess what? When I was 17 years old, I had written on my medical school application, I hope that one day I can do something meaningful with the World Health Organization, with the United Nations. When I went to Johns Hopkins, guess what? I strived and I strived. I knocked on all the doors of the professors. Give me a project with you. Give me, I was like begging them, you know, striving, 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 nothing. No doors open. Every door slammed in my face. And through this little thing, can you draw a health booklet for me? One day I get a phone call from the chairman of the WHO. And he says this, are you the professional cartoonist? And I'm like, no! Hello! Use me! I'm a little more than that. But you see how God was playing with my pride? He was saying, don't be so prideful. What's wrong if I want to use you this way? And because of that experience, earlier this year, I got deployed by the World Health Organization and the UN to Eswatini, formerly Swaziland. To, to Africa for, for seven weeks. And while I was there, it was so hard to say goodbye to my family. But the only reason I did so was when Cliff said, if God has opened up this door for you, will you not go? Will you not go? And I argued with him. I said, if I go, you are going to have the harder end of the stick looking after two toddlers under four. 
And guess what? God used my five loaves, but He used His five loaves. Because of the experience, you won't believe it. The biggest newspapers in Singapore, Yahoo Finance, these media outlets started to go to Cliff for interviews on being a stay-at-home dad and changing culture in parenting in Asian society. And I said, God, how did you open up these opportunities to shine Christ in culture? It was because Cliff said yes to the five loaves. So this is the paradox of joy, that in the fellowship of our suffering with Christ comes the deepest of joys. Friends, I want to close right here. If we could just play some music in the background. I want to move into a time of response. If we could just have some music in the background, I want us to, to think about this and leave the slides on screen. But this is the paradox of joy, that in the fellowship of suffering comes the deepest of joys. Friends, let's remember that when Christ died on the cross, it cost him something. When the little boy gave up his five barley loaves, it cost him everything. It is not a convenient thing. And if we want to bargain with God, we've got to miss out on the adventures and the stories that He has for us. When you give all, you receive all. Today as we close, as we, as we speak about unspeakable joy, would you ask God right now and say, God, what are the buried dreams that you have in my life? How are you asking me to step out? What are the five loaves that you have for me? The question I have for you today is, what will you choose to give? As you bow your heads and close your eyes, shall we pray? Father, I thank you for this morning's message and we pray that you will start to move in our hearts. Take us out of our comfort zones. Take us out of our routines and the monotony of our lives. Help us to know that there is more to life than our routines. And while that is important, while it's important to be faithful in the everyday things, God, teach me what it means to go out of my comfort zone. For some of you, it could be saying yes to going part-time or quitting your jobs to look after a parent with dementia. For some of you, it could be taking a season of time just to look after your children. That is uncomfortable too. But for some of you, it could mean stepping out instead of planning for a summer cottage vacation to go for a vision trip, a mission trip. And for some others, it could be forking out some of your savings to start some sort of ministry. I don't know what it is and I don't know what it would cost you. But today, if that's you, if God is speaking to you, would you tell Him what you would choose to give? If you sense God speaking to you right now, and if your answer is a yes, Would you just raise your hands and say, Yes, Lord, that's me. I want you to work in my life. Don't be afraid. It's just you and God. But put your hand up and say, God, that's me. God, use me. Use my five loaves. I want to be like the widow with the two mites. Use me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Those hands of sincerity, those tears, God sees them. And if that's you, I want to do one more thing. I know this might be a little unusual, but I really believe that stepping out requires a courage. And I want to open up that opportunity for those of you who have raised your hands physically or in your hearts to come down to the altar. And we want to pray for you and we want to sing along with you. And it could be a little uncomfortable, but that's exactly what we're talking about today, that discomfort. Would you come out of your comfort zones? So those of you who have raised your hands, I've seen them. God sees them. Would you take a step of courage to come forward and say, God, here I am and I'm willing to give my life to you. 
Would you come forward right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We want to open up the altars. Would you come to the front? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay. We're going to close in prayer. Some of you might be too shy to come up, but know this, that God has seen your hearts and He's seen the consecration and He wants you to bring this home with you in your hearts. So Father, I just want to pray for each and every person today that you would transform their lives. Let them give you, let us give you our five loaves. Would you use it for the glory of your kingdom? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to invite the worship team and the closing team to come up. But before that, um, I just want to share, if after the service you want to connect with me, whether it's on social media or outside at the book table, where I'll be um, putting up some books for opportunities to contribute to Kite Song Global, where we empower young people to set their dreams free, you're welcome to come and chat with me. But for now, let's welcome Jeremy and his family to sing the closing song with us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for watching. My hope is that every message on Kite Dreams will inspire you to dream bravely and live boldly for God. If you've been blessed by these messages, feel free to share them with your friends, subscribe, and I'd love to hear from you. May God grant you the courage and faith to pursue all that He has in store for you. Be blessed.